Hello everybody, good morning, welcome to the United Stands, I'm Mark Goldbridge and this is your latest Manchester United news, let's hit this week hard, it's back to football week isn't it, we're building towards that and we've got a lot to discuss this morning. As a potential UEFA European ban for Manchester United hits the headlines again, we'll talk about that, we'll delve into it, it is quite damning. I'm not concerned about it. I don't know why, but because the rule is there. We'll talk about that. It's hit the news this morning. Also talking about uh, Manchester United setting a prize for Atletico Madrid for Mason Greenwood. That's the favourite destination for him at the moment. Uh, we're also going to talk about Branthwaite, a bit of a transfer blow there with a big week for him coming up and also big interest from a club that's got more money than us to spend and probably a more attractive proposition. Um, also, nagelsmann has been speaking about his future Future. We'll bring that into the show. A midfielder that's looking more and more likely and the latest on injuries. Lots to get into on this morning's show. Uh, make sure you smash a like and subscribe. What a show it was last night, by the way. I watched it back. I don't normally watch the shows back, but you were so involved in the keep bench cell extraordinaire last night. Um, if you've not watched it, check it out. Um, big shout out to the new thumbnail as well. Long overdue. Loving that fresh look. Hopefully a fresh look for the for, for the United stand, but also a fresh look for Man United going into these next two months and the summer. So overdue and very, very happy about that. And don't forget, we've got Fabrizio Romano on the show at quarter to two today. We're going to be talking Frimpong, why we're not signing a midfielder, trying to pin him down on what strikers we're looking at. Very excited to get that. Um, good morning, everybody. Let's get into the show. So look, where's this coming from? Uh, I saw an idiot on Twitter saying, oh, Galbridge just pulls these stories out of his arse. I mean, if I did, they'd be a lot better. It would be things like... Manchester United um, invent robot legs to bring Paul Scholes back into the midfield with Roy Keane joining next season. It would be stuff like that. Uh, Ronaldo um, drinks potion that makes him 21 again and signs for United on a free. If I was making up headlines, trust me, it wouldn't be about a UEFA ban. Um, yeah, make up your headlines in the chat. We'll have a bit of fun with that. But, uh, you know... Um, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Scott McTominay gets sold to Juventus for £397 million. Um, and they have to pay that again next year and the year after that. Yeah, the, the, there's some cracking headlines out there we could make up. Anyway, this is where it's coming from. Manchester United could be barred from playing. This is not a made up one now. Uh, Man United could be barred from playing in Europe next season as UEFA refused to change ownership rules in massive blow to part owner Sir Jim Radcliffe. So obviously we've heard about this before. Uh, Ineos own Manchester United, 25% uh, of it, but they also own uh, Ineos. And um, basically, Lee, this rule's been in place, which I'll explain to you in a moment. But UEFA regulations have stated that while multiple teams under the same ownership can play in Europe going forward, a ban on said teams playing in the same competition will remain in place. In fact, a source from UEFA has told uh, this uh, news outlet, this is in the Daily Mail, it is correct that Manchester United and Nice cannot play in the same competition. They could play in different competitions as there is no feeding between competitions anymore. So as it stands, uh, Eric Ten Hag and Man United are, six behind top, uh, are in sixth place. Uh, nice, I believe, are in fifth place. So if we qualify for the um, Champions League in fifth place and Nice are in fourth place, We'll go into the Conference League under this current ruling. It gets very complicated, but basically the, the way this goes is Manchester United and Nice, under current rules, are owned by Ineos in some way, shape or form. They cannot play in the same European competition and there can be no prospect of that happening. So Man United can't play in the Europa League and Nice in the Champions League or vice versa because... Obviously, you can drop into the Europa League from the Champions League. So you have to go in the Conference League if you finished lower. So if Man United finished higher in the Premier League, say fourth, and Nice finished fifth, then we would go into the Champions League and they would go into the Conference League. If, as things stand at the moment, we go into the Europa League and Nice go into the Europa League or the Champions League, we'll go into the Conference League because they're, they're higher than us at the moment. So it's a problem. However, there is another kicker. If we win the FA Cup and Nice finish fifth, they go into the Conference League, we go into the Europa League because winning a cup outdoes qualifying for the Europa League. However, if we win the FA Cup and they finish in a Champions League spot, we go in the Conference League because a Champions League spot is bigger than winning a domestic trophy. So basically, 
this is where we're at. Um, now, I've spoken to people about this three months ago, and I spoke, I sent a message into the same people again this morning. And what they've said to me is that there is no concern at this moment in time that United would be kept out of the Europa League or the Champions League if they finished behind Nice, who are currently in fifth place. Now, Nice could drop further. They're not doing particularly well at the moment. They've only lost, uh, they've only won one of their last five. They're in fifth place and they are one point ahead of Lens, who, um, you know, are doing a little bit better than them. But also, they're, only, they're also joint fourth place with Lille. Uh, and they're only um, four point, three points off third place Monaco. And uh, they're only four points off second place Brest. Um, so, look, I, I, I don't really... I mean, Pete Morris says it's a dog's dinner. It's... What about Man City and Girona? Well, Man City will finish higher than Girona, you would expect, Ice. But I would imagine it's the same situation as well. What I was told two months ago is that, yes, the rule is in place... But Manchester United, Ineos, are in total confidence that this will not be an issue come the summer. So, you know what? I think we have to keep an eye on it. I think it's a concern, but you can only go based on what you've been told. And what we were told two months ago, and again this morning, is Ineos and United are not concerned about this rule. And I suppose the thing is, if Man United qualified for the Europa League or the Champions League, but Nice finished higher in the French League and United were banned from the Champions League and the Europa League and had to go in the Conference League, there's probably going to be a court case. There's, you know, I think basically the law is there, but nobody expects anybody to do anything about it. And actually, it could be more detrimental to Nice if we actually finished above them and they don't go into Europe. But, it, but the look, people can hide away from it. People can say it's nonsense, but it is true. There is that law there. You cannot have clubs that are owned by the same owners in the same tournament in Europe. So you can't be in the Champions League or the Europa League if another club's in there because that tournament sort of crosses over with each other. So, look, the rule is there. People are talking about it again. Factually, it's a concern. But Man United are not worried about it. So... I, I don't know whether they've been given assurances by UEFA that there's a rule change coming in or not. It would. What I will say is, because there's not a lot, there's not, there's not a lot more to say about it really. What I will say is, why would Manchester United and the Glazers and Ineos do this deal if they knew this was going to be a problem in the summer? And secondly, why is Ten Hag's job even being spoken about around European qualification? if it doesn't matter what Ten Hag does, because we won't be able to play in Europe if Nice finish higher than us anyway. So that would be my two questions. Why has this deal been done? And secondly, you know, why are we talking about the need to win the FA Cup or the need to get into the Champions League spots when actually the biggest barrier at the moment isn't actually what we do on the pitch. It's what UEFA say about dual ownership. Um, the Red Bull group have both in the Champions League together for years, says JS. Yeah, I've read about that one and um, there is something around that on how they get around it and I don't know how they do. Um, I know it's a very different thing, um, but, you know, there we go. Uh, Kevin Good says, uh, um, so Jim is a minority owner. Yeah, there's a lot of people jumping in on, in on stuff, trying to be experts again. You're wrong. You're wrong. Uh, the rule is that Manchester United are partially owned by Ineos and so is Nice and therefore... Uh, connected owners, whatever you want to call it. Look, we're, we're red-handed on that. There's no technical, so Jim's not technically in control of it or anything like that. We are bang to rights, as are Man City and Girona. We are bang to rights on it. I just don't think the law would be passed through. It's there, but I don't. I, I think. I, I think. I think. I, I'm not concerned about it. First of all, let's qualify for the Champions League or Europa League, and I guarantee we'll be playing in them next season, no matter what happens with Nice. But that that rule is there. It is there. But um, he, it's got nothing to do with him not being a majority owner. We are bang to rights on it. So anybody in the chat who's saying, oh, he's not a majority owner, that's not the rule. The fact that we, they own 30% of United and all of Nice is enough. And it's the same with the City group. But um, I guess we'll have to just wait and see what happens. But I'm not open. I'm not that concerned about it. Um, Ricardo has been a member for 11 months. He says, happy birthday to Jaden Sancho. Is it? Um... 
Yeah, well, you know, I'm not going to say not happy birthday to him, but uh, he's 24 today. He's only 24 today. Bloody hell. Um, wasting his career, isn't he? Uh, that's on him, I suppose. Hopefully it's a brighter future and a better year. Um, that McTominay headline could be true, says Robert. Don't know what McTominay headline you're talking about, so can't really comment on that. Um, Jim says, I think this will be a non-event. Nothing will happen if we both get the Champions League. Um, and Daniel says the biggest problem is they'll, 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 they will struggle to implement the rule, um, even though rules should be rules. Yeah, I don't think Man United are that worried about it, to be honest with you. Um, that's what the feedback we're getting. Right, let's talk about Branthwaite. Big into transfers this morning. Obviously, we've got Fabrizio on the show at lunchtime. Can't wait for that. Um, bit of a Jared Branthwaite blow for Ten Hag and Manchester United. Why, say ye? Why? Well, effectively, uh, numerous outlets this morning are talking that Manchester City are interested. He's going to be playing for England tomorrow as well. Harry Maguire is um, having a scan with Manchester United this week. Um, he's not expected to be fit for the Brentford game. Um, could be out for a period of time again, which is a blow for Man United in the short term. Hopefully Martinez is back. We do have Lindelof and Evans, so hopefully we can cover that Maguire injury. But from an England point of view, he will play tomorrow. He will play at left-sided centre-back tomorrow. He's a left-footed player. This is expected to be Branthwaite's moment in front of the watching public. He will play tomorrow against Belgium. And if he plays well tomorrow, Everton are expecting another 10 million to go onto the transfer fee that they would demand. Also, they're expecting a lot more eyes to be looking at him. There is this expectation that Branthwaite tomorrow will really announce himself to the wider European football community. Um, that's a blow for Manchester United because this is a player that we've been looking at for a long time and we really do like and we do have good relationships with Everton. But obviously, the more people are aware of his talent, uh, the more people will look at him, the more price will be demanded. And Manchester City are certainly a club looking at him. And he fits the bill. You know, he fits the bill. I mean, it's John Stones all over again. John Stones was at Everton. They snapped him up at Man City and look at him now. And Man City are apparently looking to do the same with Jared Branthwaite. He's homegrown. This is a big thing for Man City. Their financials, 115, are absolutely incredible. They can afford to just go, there's £100 million for Neves. There's £80 million for Jared Branthwaite. We've done our business by the end of June. See you all later. They can just spend £200 million quid and be absolutely fine and all go off and enjoy their holiday. And... You know, it's funny because both those players, I think, would be transformative for Manchester United. Jao Neves from Benfica, Jared Branthwaite from Everton. They'd both be transformative for us. But the team we're trying to catch is probably going to go for them and has a very good chance of getting them and certainly has the wealth to do it. We don't have the wealth to spend £180 million on those two players. Hence, the enormity of the job we have to close the gap on a squad and team and manager that's far better than us who can go and get targets that we would like to make themselves even better than us. Um, but Branthwaite and Man City is now becoming a thing. And I don't know how you compete with that, really, because, you know, he will look at that. There's a lot of England players playing for Man City. Pep Guardiola has developed people like John Stones and Foden into, you know, unique and talented technical footballers. Everything about Branthwaite and Man City makes a lot of sense. So it's a it's a it's a problem for Manchester United because I think when you're up against those types of you know um, obstacles, it's a real difficult one. Now look, it's a test. It's a test. We took Barada from City. We're taking Ashworth from Newcastle. Um, the next test is can you do that with transfers? Because I would expect Man City to win that race if they enter it, and there's no reason why they wouldn't. Um, they do have a lot of defenders, though. I mean, they've got Aki, they've got Akanji, they've got Vardiel, they've got Diaz, they've got Stones. They're all relatively young, so maybe maybe that's an opportunity that they might not go there. But you just don't know with Pep. You know, he, he wants to accumulate an army, doesn't he? And, he? and he may well go in for that again. Look, it's a challenge. The price is going to be a challenge as well. But these are the challenges that Ineos are meant to be coming in to solve. So whilst I wouldn't write Branthwaite off at the moment... Um, I think that there will definitely be competition for him and I'd keep an eye on that one, certainly tomorrow. Uh, Makish says there's a cheaper Branthwaite uh, Europe somewhere, not a world beater. Yeah, look, I, I agree with that. I think that there are 100% some talents out there that would certainly um, better improve Manchester United for far better prices and that comes down to scouting. But I don't, I don't know. I can't see 
how we're in a position to do that this summer. If you haven't got the director of football to implement the scouting system, how does the current scouting system produce players it's never produced in the last few years? So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, Everton trying to raise price by claiming City want him, says Mark Joy. Uh, well, the, my, my bigger concern, Mark, is more about the game tomorrow for England because Real Madrid have been mentioned. Um, clubs... Uh, you know, even an Arsenal, like people are always looking for centre backs. There's not an, a massive amount of centre backs out there with the capability to be top class slash world class. So, you know, Branthwaite plays well for England tomorrow. So it's one thing playing well for Everton, but when you go and do it in an England shirt, um, then people do take more notice. Um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see what happens with that one. Uh, next thing I wanted to talk about was Mason Greenwood, actually. A uh, piece coming out of Spain that Atletico Madrid have been fen uh, have been left flabbergasted and outraged by the price that Manchester United are quoting for Mason Greenwood. Uh, apparently, Manchester United want fifty million pounds, not euros, for Mason Greenwood, and Atletico Madrid are absolutely outraged by it. Um, it's an interesting story this Monday morning and it's one I would like to have some element of truth in it because if we're going to sell a Manchester United player this summer, of course I would like it to be sold for for, for the top price we can get because it benefits the club, uh, it benefits the transfer budget. Um, I, I don't think Manchester United are going to achieve £50 million for Mason Greenwood. There are two months left of the season. Um, if he could score a few hat tricks between now and then, then then maybe that price can be bumped up a little bit. But I think we all know that the price is going to be around sort of 35, 40 million pounds um, based on a number of factors, really. One being that there is no Premier League market because no Premier League club will go near him at the moment. And, you know, that that cheapens the price. And also how many clubs in Europe can afford 50 million pounds for Mason Greenwood? None. So we're going to top out at about 35 to 40 million pounds, I think. And um, United would do well to demand a high price. And in a normal market, I think he's well worth 50 million pounds. I would argue he's worth more. But in this market, I think if we achieve 40, we'll have done really well. 35 is probably what's achievable. I would imagine, being as we've been bent over loads doing this, I would imagine whatever deal we do, even if it was as low as 35 million pounds, there will be elements of the deal um, in relation to add-ons, uh, percentages of future sales, um, and potentially, potentially even a first option if the club that he goes to sells him. Um, I think all those things are logical. I don't think anyone's spoken about them. We can talk and talk about Mason Greenwood being sold or kept or, or, or whatever, but I think we're going to sell him. I think it's the logical thing to do. But I also think it's really logical to have add-ons in there because if he starts banging in goals for Atletico Madrid left, right and centre, we're going to look really stupid letting him go for £35 million. So I think we need add-ons in there. I think we need percentage of the next sale in there. So if he goes for £80 million, we should have you know 15 20% of that as well. Uh, and also I think we need a first refusal in case... You know, in two or three years' time, the land lies a little bit differently uh, and we could move in ourselves. So I think all those things are are, are absolutely essential in what we do. Luciano, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for your super chat there. Man United should give game time to Shola Shorote, uh, says Leon. I'd forgotten that player exists. Um, I don't. I, I can't speak really about that one. I don't know whether he is uh, somebody that we, we should be looking at or not. Um, the uh, volume is not low, Gary, because I have a volume um, level thing. And I know when I go like this, it goes into the red. So you need to turn yours up, mate. Um, career mode, Mark, it's definitely coming back. Uh, I think I, I've had the bug bitten now. I've played a bit of pro clubs for the for the Ginge team. So it's definitely coming back, yes. Um, not saying he isn't any good, says Gaz, but I'm not on the Branthwaite train. Certainly not for that fee. Let's be thrown about. I'd be all up for it if it was 30 to 40 million pounds. And that's a great point by Gaz, actually. I do think that, you know, 60, 70 million pounds for Branthwaite is certainly achievable with European centre-backs for a lot less. You can't drop from the Champions League to the Europa League anymore, says Luciano. You can. You can. You fin Oh! 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 Oh, Luke Charno. Um, you might have solved the problem. 
You can't drop to Europa. Let me just read this. I've just figured it out. So basically, there's a new Champions League format, isn't it? Um, the top eight teams will automatically qualify for the knockout stages, while teams in 9th to 24 will enter a two-legged playoff for the remaining eight places. Uh, the losers of the playoff fixture will be eliminated and will not drop down to the Europa League. So there you go. From next season, uh, Luciano. This is a, this is a bit, this is a little bit like Frimpong being homegrown. This is um, this is why this chat is is goated because not only do we bring you the news, you bring the news as well. So basically, going back to what we were talking about at the start of the show, um, if Nice finish above Man United, say they finish third and go in the Champions League, and we finish sixth and we go in the Europa League. We wouldn't be able to play in the Europa League because you can drop from the Champions League into the Europa League. So Nice could drop into the same league and you can't be in the same tournament. However, from next season, the new Champions League format does not drop into the Europa League. So this sort of solves the problem. Well done, Luciano. Well done. Um, we, we, it's sort of this. Maybe this is why Man United aren't worried about it and we've completely missed it. Um, if United finish in sixth and... Nice finishing the top four and going to the Champions League and winning the Europa League, we're fine. We'll be in the Europa League. The problem would be if we both qualify for the Europa League, um, one of us will drop in the Conference League. So that would be the problem. Or if they finish second and we finished fourth or fifth, we'd have to go in the Europa League because they're in the Champions League because bo we both can't be in that. So, um, yeah, it's... Um, it's a bit of a change, I suppose. There's no drop downs in the UEFA competitions next season once the group stage starts. So as long as we qualify automatically and Nice don't, we're fine, says Charles. And uh, Angel and Soul says, what if United lose final to City in the FA Cup? Doesn't that mean United get FA Cup winner's spot as City in the Champions League? Um, says Angel and Soul. Um, if you win the FA Cup, if you lose the FA Cup final, you don't get the Europa League spot, no. Um, you, it goes to, I think it goes to a league position. Yeah, it goes to a league position. Yeah, so yeah, that's what happens with that. Um, let me talk to you about the manager situation. We're going to be asking Fabrizio at lunchtime if all these rumours about talks with Southgate and everyone else are bollocks just to fill the international break last week. But Nagelsmann has spoken about his future again. Remember last week he said he wants to know where he's going before the end of the season so he can focus exclusively on Germany. He's now come out again and said that he wouldn't rule out staying at Germany beyond the Euros. Uh, Luciano is a new member as well. Absolute legend. Thank you, Luciano. Get your badge in. So Nagelsmann is basically saying that he can envisage staying at Germany as their national team coach um, for a longer period than this season. Uh, obviously, they played a game of football on Saturday and they beat France 2-0 um, away from home as well, um, which was a friendly. Uh, France uh, lined up with the likes of Mbacano, Pavard, Chouamini, Rabiot, Taram, Dembele, Mbappe, Kunde, a very strong French team. Uh, they lost 2-0 to Germany with goals from Wurz and Havertz. Uh, Gundogan, Havertz, Wurz, Muziala, Kroos, uh, Kimmich was playing, Rüdiger. So, you know, maybe maybe Germany are on the bounce back now. Maybe they are on the bounce back. So, uh, interesting. Charlie Max is back in business. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we sort of solved it for you, which is good to see. Thank you very much for that. Um, also off topic, but I'm liking these new thumbnail designs, says Chris. Yeah, big shout out the thumbnails. They, they look, we, we'd had the old thumbnails for about two, three years. You should be changing them every season, really. Um, so we left it too long, but, uh, yeah, sad to say goodbye to the old ones, but in with the new, which is, uh, what it should be. So big shout out to Matt and Ryan on that one. Um, it was a decent performance from Ger Germany. Uh, Mark, can you join Angry Ginger's Pro Clubs team? I've already played for it, Meal. I played last night. I was contender for, for, for player of the night. I played for about an hour and a half before the eight o'clock show. So, uh, yeah. Um, let's. Oh, just, just sticking with France, actually. Uh, a report also coming in from... Um, I can't remember where I read this one. 
basically Rabio, Rabio being linked to Manchester United again. Um, I think we've spoken about him before. I'm so, I certainly want to get the inside track from uh, Fabrizio Romano on this at lunchtime. But again, I think there's really want to talk to him about Frimpong, really want to talk to him about Rabio because the interesting thing about these two players, and you might not want them, is that Frimpong and Rabio, we both went for in the first summer transfer window under Ten Hag and last summer transfer window. So is it going to be third time lucky or are we going to ignore both of those players? Um, it's going to be uh, rather interesting in relation to that. Um, but look, uh, I think some of these sort of signings um, are going to be um, essential, I suppose, when it comes to um, Manchester United summer. We, 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 we can't... Welcome to the Members Club, Charlie. We can't spend £50, £60 million pounds on every player that we want. There has to be some... Uh, there has to be some bargains in there, doesn't there? Um, Ericsson in Ten Hag's first season was a really astute deal. and But the issue with Rabiot would be his wages. This was the problem that Murtagh had when he flew out to speak to his mum, who actually is Rabiot's agent. So, you know, that, that could be problematic in itself, I guess. But we have got to be um, creative in this summer transfer window in looking at... Look, we got linked to the Fulham guy, Tosson who I believe is out of contract. And uh, I think we spoke, I think Beth spoke about this last week, but uh, his, um, I think he's got the same agent as Martinez. Um, so he's 26 and he's out of contract for um, Fulham in the summer. Um, now, look, he, he, he doesn't jump out as, Jareth Brand, uh, as Jared Branthwaite or Tadebo, but you know, he's played a few games for Fulham this season and he has, you know, I think he's reasonably quick. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I think about that, to be honest. I mean, it's not my ideal. Rabiot's not my ideal. But where do you go? Where do you go with regards to, you're going to, we need to buy six or seven players and we can't afford to pay top dollar for all of them. So in certain positions, you're going to have to go for a free transfer or, or something like that. Um, I mean, I'm not convinced on Tossin, to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, Makish says I like him. He, he's a great passer. Um, but I'm not I'm not 100% sure about whether that's the right deal to do. However, you know, there is value in bringing players in. Rabio looks like a problem player. In the dressing dressing around uh, dressing the uh, dressing uh, here it is <laughs> every morning it's the only time I sneeze I sneeze about twenty five minutes into the morning show every morning if you know you know you know the rules um, Nigel says Rabio looks like a problem player in the dressing room um, look Rabio is better than McTominay he's miles better than McTominay you know uh, if 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 Scott McTominay is a Vauxhall Astra then Rabio is a Formula One car. Like I I'll have that argument with anybody. Rabio is infinitely better than than McTominay. Um, if you brought Rabio to Manchester United, he's actually there competing with Casemiro um, as our best midfielder on paper. Uh, obviously, mainu has got amazing potential. But look, honestly, if we had Casemiro, Rabio, and Mainu, I'd be very happy. You've got three players that can play the holding midfield role there. I'd be very, very happy. You've solved your problem straight away. So I'd be very happy to bring Casemiro in, uh, sorry, Rabio in, because we need somebody that can play that role. Now, I'd prefer Gomez from Wolves. Of course I would. I'd love João Neves from Benfica. But what I'm saying is we, can't, we, we have to be realistic. Um, the big problem with Rabio is personality, wage. That will probably be the barrier. But the fact that United have looked at him twice means that it will certainly go to whoever the director of footballer is, whoever the CEO is, to have a look at. Um, and if they say, no, he's not the right player, then we'll move on to somebody else. But I think you have to consider that sort of thing, um, certainly. Um, does Rabio feel like more of the same? End of contract, big ego. I was hoping Ineos would go for a different approach, says Charlie. Exactly, Charlie. I think that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, I, you know, let's put it in the hands of the new regime and uh, they can make a decision from there. Talking about the midfield, by the way, I saw another 
comparison of Mainu to Seedorf again. And I'm like, God, is that just what ex players and their producers do these days? There's a new player on the, there's a new kid on the block. Who can we compare him to? Let's go for the most obvious, you know, player that we can we can compare him to. And I'm, I'm telling you now, Mainu to me reminds me more of Jack Wilshire than anybody else, and I don't think he's the next Jack Wilshire. And people will go, "Oh, shut up, Mark." Jack Wilshire was a really good player when he broke on the scene. He had really good low centre of gravity. He was good in the tackle. He could dribble and he could play quick passes as well. well this Seedorf stuff from people who probably only saw about 30 of Seedorf's games, 90 minutes. I mean, are you telling me that all these ex-players spent most of their time scanning fucking websites to watch Seedorf play for Milan or, or whoever else he was playing for? Did they bollocks? You know, it, it's just lazy. Kobe Mainu is the next Kobe Mainu. We don't know what he's going to be. He might be a 10. He might be a holding midfielder. He might be box to box. You know, he might fall off a cliff and end up playing for Preston North End. He might become the world's greatest ever player and play for Real Madrid. Who knows what he's going to be, but he's certainly his own player. I just, I find it really irritating when you see, oh, this player's this, the next this, this player's the next that. Who's Ganacho then? Who's, who's Ganacho the next? Because he's nothing like Ronaldo or Messi. So who's who's Ganacho? He's Ganacho. And that's my point. Who's Rasmus? Who's Rasmus the next? Oh, he's the next Haaland because he get, his, his surname begins with H and Denmark's not far away from Norway and he's got blonde hair and he's a striker. I mean, we've just, we've just moved past that. For the last year, Rasmus has been the next Haaland. And now we've got Main who's the next Seedorf or is the next whatever. Like, for God's sake, stop being so lazy in your analysis. They're their own player and they've not developed yet. Rasmus is the next Rasmus. Ganacho is the next Ganacho, And Mainu is the next Mainu, And they're all at Man United. And all I care about is there are players and people are talking about them. But they're not the next anything. They are their own entity. And they must be allowed to grow into that. Because patience is absolutely essential with a young player. You never know what's going to happen with injury. You never know what's going to happen with development. And actually, I don't think it does us any good when people start saying he's the next Seedorf or he's the next Haaland because it just puts a label or a pressure on them that we as fans of United should be saying, piss off with your labels. We're protecting this talent and it will nurture with us into the name it is, not the name you want to stick on it. And that's what it should all be about. Um, who's the next Maguire, says Mihir. Look, I just think that Mainu has exclusive talents that we haven't seen in the English game for a very long time. Ganacho has exclusive wing talents that we haven't seen at Manchester United for a very long time. And Rasmus has exclusive attacking traits that we haven't seen at Manchester United for a very long time. There are players to develop. Uh Mark, would you take Faye at United from Barca, says Abdul. I don't know a lot about him. I know he's like 19 centre-back. United have held talks with Barcelona. Two plus two is four. I know that. Um, but I, I, I don't I don't know. Look, maybe we will move for him. Maybe we won't move for him. What I will say is that there is a lot of if, buts and maybes with Manchester United this summer. There's if, buts and maybes about how our summer's going to go in relation to who's leading the summer transfer window. Is it still Ten Hag and Murta? Because that's the current regime. Or is Dan Ashworth going to be in in time? Or is Barada going to take control of it? Is Sir David Brailsford involved? We don't even know what the blueprint for our summer transfer window is. So it's very difficult to start going, well, Dan Ashworth wanted this player at Newcastle, so we'll buy him this summer. He's not even in post yet. Um, Ten Hag wanted Frimpong the last two summers, but maybe, maybe, maybe Ineos don't. You know, there's there's too much to predict at the moment, and uh, notwithstanding all the manager talk, so it's very very hard to predict. And of course, on top of that, it's very hard to know what the transfer budget is. I mean, I don't think the transfer budget's particularly big. I think it's about 100, 150 million pounds, but it can become 250, 300 million pounds if we sell well. So that dictates a lot as well. I sneeze every morning from being hungry, says Hoots, but I'm not hungry. I had a lovely breakfast this morning. I had Greek yogurt, um, half a teaspoon of cinnamon, some walnuts, blueberries, and then sprinkled on some ground almonds. Healthy bridge. And uh, it makes me feel a lot fuller. I'm messing around with my breakfasts at the moment. For years, I had porridge and, porridge and banana, and I always thought that was a really sustainable uh, breakfast, but it, it just led to really big... You know, you feel good for an hour and then massive drop. So I'm looking at, you know, sustainable energy. Tree bridge. Um, made of wood. 
Oh yes. Uh, anyway, morning Mark, with summer stuff becoming clearer by the day, what do you envisage our summer looking like? Ins, outs, staff, Ten Hag, any surprises, says Tom. I think we'll learn a hell of a lot at lunchtime with Fabrizio because we've got some good questions to ask him around specific players and the manager scenario. So I think by two o'clock today, we'll know a lot more. However, Tom, I predict Ten Hag will be the manager next season because he should be. That will lead to a clear out in the summer that is required. I believe you will see people like wan Harry Maguire, Eriksson, um, Greenwood, Sancho, uh, Williams, Donny, Martial, I think maybe Casemiro or Varane or both will go as well. So I think we'll see about 10 players go. Um, incomings, logically, if wan goes, Frimpong comes in. Logically, we bring, bring two centre-backs in. Logically, I think we bring in a Rabiot or someone like that in the midfield and we bring a striker in and a Lisi. So that would be my prediction that covers all of that. Uh, what are your thoughts on the partnership with Malaysia Airlines, says Alan. I haven't heard anything about this. So unless, if this is, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about in relation to that. Uh, so is that, I don't know what that is. Um, Duncania says, I'm catching up today. So many have missed it, but don't only three teams from France qualify for the Champions League or does it change next season, says Duncania. Um as long as we're not in the same tournament, I don't think it really matters, Duncania. The Champions League, if if Nice qualify for the Champions League and we qualify for the Europa League, it's fine. It's just if we're both in the, qualify for the same thing, it becomes problematic. So if Nice qualify for the Champions League and finish third, and we qualify for the Champions League and finish fifth, under the current ruling, we wouldn't go in the Champions League, we'd go in the Europa League because we can't play in the same one. Um Uh, Mark, if Ineos let go of Ten Hag in the summer, do you think we could actually get Emery or Ange, says Meal. It'd be very expensive to do it. I don't think it would make a, make, make much sense today um, to do that. Um, I've done that one. I'm just catching up here. Thank you, Duncania. Appreciate that. Um, there was a bit of talk this morning coming out with... Uh, Apparently, we uh, apparently Malaysia Airlines is our official airline provider. I mean, I, I, we, we've got we've got more brand, we've got more brands at Man United than Sainsbury's have got. You know, it's 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 ridiculous, really. But uh, look, that's the that's the brandification of football, isn't it? It's money. You know, you can have a brand partner for everything. I mean, we've been contacted at the United stand by brand partners wanting to do stuff, and I, and I I think they're taking the piss. Like, I think we've got an official brand partner for crypto. Like, I think we've got an. We've probably got an official brand partner for slippers, um, toothpaste. Like the, the the world, it's endless, really, absolutely endless. Um, there was a story about the stadium. I find it quite boring, so I've kept it towards the end. Um, the story about the stadium are that um, oh, Rasmus has had an interesting bit of breaking news here. Breaking news from Rasmus Maximus: Oats and bananas are full of sugar. That's why you get a drop off. Look for something with low carb, high protein and healthy fats. Eggs, avocados, keeps you going all day, says Rasmus. Well, well I, think that, I think that's what I'm doing, isn't it? Greek yogurt, nuts, bit of fruit. Yeah, seems a bit better. Um, Joe says Tory Bridge. You're not, a Tory, you're not a Tory just because you have a healthy breakfast, Joe. And I'll tell you something, Joe. You can call me Tory Bridge if you like, but you couldn't be more wrong. I didn't go to school beyond my GCSEs. I came from a working class background and I'm self-made. So I'm certainly not a Tory. So shove that up your arse. Um, I don't want to get political on you, but uh, you couldn't be more wrong. There's perce This is what I mean. Don't judge a book by its cover. If I can do this, whatever this is, then any of you can. You know, I, I, I should be a role model. No, I shouldn't. Um, anyway, we've wandered off there. Right, I want to talk about the stadium. So there's been some talk this morning that Manchester United have given the contract to the same people who did the Spurs stadium. Uh, there's talk of a 100,000 capacity stadium. I think that, look, all I'll say about the stadium is because you'll get a lot of people spending 20 minutes talking to you about the stadium and basically they're talking out their arse, quoting news articles, etc. We don't need to do that on this channel. We're going to build a new stadium. The question is, where will it be? How much will it cost and when will it happen? And the, the, the headline here from Ineos is 
that, well, it's not from Ineos directly, but the headline here is, and you can take this to the bank and you can cash it in. So Jim Radcliffe is into his 70s. So Jim Radcliffe in 10 years or even 20 years is going to decline, isn't he? You know, he's not going to live forever is what I'm saying. He has a period of time to complete a project, which is a passion project for him. He will not hang around on the stadium. It will be something that moves progressively quickly now. We've been talking about it for 20 years. The Glazers have just left, left Old Trafford to rot. This will move quickly. Now, what it will be, I don't know. Where it will be, I don't know. How much it will cost, I don't know. But what we will end up with is a stadium which is state-of-the-art with a capacity somewhere between 90 and 100,000 around the Old Trafford area in the vicinity of Old Trafford. It could be on Old Trafford, it could be next door, but I guarantee you in the next five years it will be done because Sir Jim Radcliffe will want this visual representation of what he's doing. Is doing. So yeah, 100%, that's what will happen. Um, what should determine Eric Ten Hag's future? Top four and FA Cup, says International. No, no. I mean, I think it's a great question, by the way. Um... Let's run a poll on it. I'm trying to think how I can construct this. Does he need to win the FA Cup to stay in his job? Yes or no? I'll do that one. Um, RM stands for Malaysia, which is currency. It says you are... AVG Gamer. Thank you very much. Um, Akil says, do you think Gore could be involved next season? You never know. You never know because you never know what the intention is with Ten Hag. Like, obviously, he wanted to bring Mainu and Ahmad through this season and that's what he's done. Uh, he will have a player or two to bring through next season. We don't know who that's going to be at the moment. Um, Akil says, if we, get top f if we reach the FA Cup final and get top five, that's more than enough. Um, I don't think he needs to win the FA Cup to stay in a job. I've heard I've heard United fans talking about it and they're talking out their arse, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Um, basically, what my feeling is, is that sixth place is where we deserve to be across the season because people can say he's got to get fifth place. What are you watching? I think there needs to be a logical realism here. And if we get sixth place and we get to the FA Cup final, he should stay in his job. I don't know why people are moving the the, the, the the ground now, saying he's got to get Champions League football or he's got to win the FA Cup to stay in his job. To me, that's media-driven. It's the journalists who have never liked him trying to set a new standard, which is incredible. I've never seen a season like this. The, the sale of the football club has massively caused problems. But the injury... I mean, even now, Maguire's injured. Like, the injury crisis never stops. People have long passed. Moved. Remember at Christmas, people said, when we get our players back. We've never got our players back. We never will get our players back. Luke Shaw won't be back. Maguire's injured now. Who's next? This injury crisis has been all season. It's mitigating. It's huge. So as long as we finish sixth and we get to the FA Cup final, in my opinion, he should stay in the job. Because why, why, why would you demand fifth when... Obviously, Arsenal, Liverpool and Man City are way better than us. But Villa and Spurs are better than us. Like, they're better than us. They've got a better team and they've got a better style of football. So, we're not even in. It's not like we deserve fifth place. It's not like we're missing out on fifth place. It's not like we're in a false position. We don't deserve fifth. So, I would say sixth place and FA Cup final. Uh, and I would also say, in regards to the FA Cup, how somebody can say he's got to win the FA Cup to stay in his job. And then you look at the reality. It's like sending Bilbo Baggins into a fight with Tyson Fury and saying, if you don't beat him, don't come home. You're, you're banished from the family. Uh, yeah, I'm literally fighting the heavyweight champion of the world, who is a massive favourite. It's like, come on. If we're playing Spurs in the final, OK, you've got to go and beat them. I don't care. You've got to beat Spurs in a final. But Man City in a final, they are way better than us. So I, I don't think that the FA Cup has to be 
he's got to win that to stay in a job. You're telling me if, we, if he loses to Man City, we'll sack him the next day because he lost to Man City. And yet we've never given him the tools to compete with Man City. It would be ridiculous, in my opinion. Um, we'll stop trusting Ineas if they sign Southgate, says Shabazz. It would be a bloody mess. An absolute mess. Um, yeah, it'd be an absolute mess. I mean, look, I even heard... Um, um, what's his name? Andy Mitten on, on Talk Sport the other day. He was saying that, you know, and I, I would expect he would be quite pro in the and I think he is, but even he said, look, Southgate absolutely cannot be the next Man United manager. Um, and, he, and even he was saying, quite rightly, that Ineos needs to be held accountable. You know, they've had the, the wave of optimism. They must be held accountable. Like, you, you, if they make bad decisions, we can't just sit there kissing their ass. They have to be held accountable now. They've had the honeymoon period. They're in charge of a football club. All owners of football clubs are accountable. Um, he also made a point that, you know, some United fans are actually starting to question Ineos now already, um, saying things like, if Sir Jim Radcliffe, and these aren't my words, this is what Andy Mitten said on the radio, he said, you know, Sir Jim Radcliffe's a big Man United fan, but he's barely been to the club in the last 40 years. So, you know, the, the cracks aren't starting to appear, but people are starting to hold them accountable. And that's a good thing. We want them to do well, but we need to move past the whole godlike status of kissing their ass. They've had the honeymoon. They're in charge of the football club, the footballing side of things. We should hold them accountable. There shouldn't be this whole, oh, I'm just going to trust what they're going to do. I'm just going to trust what they can do. We do need to vocalise our opposition to things. And the, the way that the fans vocalised their opposition to Southgate last week, I think, was fantastic. The message is clear. Do not do that. Do not do that. Do not bring in someone like that. Or, you know what? And also, I'm not going to be that guy who says anything's better than Southgate. So, look, for example, if it's not Gareth Southgate, and here's a question for you. Is it just Southgate that gets your blood bubbling high? Or is it also um, the fact that... Um, Oh, we've just got to bring another story in here. Um, is it also the fact that, you know, for me, I'd be... I mean, Southgate's useless, but I would be absolutely furious if we went for Thomas Frank or Graham Potter. You know, it's not just Southgate that I'd be fuming with Ineos for. Thomas Frank, Graham Potter, no. I'd be fuming with those as well. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely not. Uh, just a bit of a breaking story coming in here. Big shout out to Matt, one of our admins. Uh, Atletico Madrid want to sign Brazilian Atalanta midfielder Edison in the summer. Well, look, that is a player that United was scouting extensively, but we'll have to ask Fabrizio about this at lunchtime because he said last week that Man United aren't looking for a midfielder anymore. So if we're not looking for a midfielder anymore, then Edison probably doesn't come, which is a shame because I think he will go on and have a very good career at another club. Uh, we will only trust Ten Hag without accountability, to Shabazz. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Don't forget, quarter to two today, it's going to be a massive show for Brizio live, answering all the questions we need to ask him. And we're certainly going to come out of that with a lot more knowledge. Uh, have a great day, everybody. I'm back at eight o'clock. Big up the new thumbnail. Make sure you smash a like on the like on the video for it. If you didn't watch Start uh, Bench Cell from last night, it's well worth a watch. Very interactive. If you're at work, just keep it on in the background or whatever. Um, and have a great day. What a great show this morning. We've hit the week hard and we will continue to hit it hard, progressing towards United back playing football three games in a week from Saturday evening. Let's do it. Take care, everyone.